In the late 2000s, there were few fighters more famous than Quentin Rampage Jackson. A combination of explosive power and a vibrant personality made him one of the most popular fighters in both Pride and the UFC. In 2013, Bellator MMA paid big bucks to make Rampage the face of their promotion, only to end up with a bloated, unmotivated shadow of his former self. Welcome to the INC, and this is the story of Rampage Jackson in Bellator. At one point in time, you could arguably say Quentin Rampage Jackson was the biggest star in MMA. After starting his career with a 10-1 record, Rampage first came to prominence competing in Pride Fighting Championships. And after losing his company debut to Kazushi Sakuraba, he quickly endeared himself with his affable personality and aggressive fighting style. Most notably, with his infamous Rampage Slam, which he'd used to fend off submission threats. Oh, Dan, I told you, he picked him up and slammed him to the ground! Oh, he's out! He's I out! He knocked him out! Rampage's form continued when he signed for the UFC, beating Chuck Liddell in only his second match to win the company's light heavyweight title. Along the way, he claimed excellent wins over Dan Henderson, Lyoto Machida, and former Pride rival Vanderlei Silva. Rampage's success even caught the eye of Hollywood, most notably in 2010 when he was cast as B.A. Baracus for a big screen adaptation of the A-Team. By 2012, Rampage's star had started to fade. Three straight losses and a significant weight miss to Ryan Bader left the UFC unsure over whether to renew the 34-year-old's contract, and he formally entered free agency after unanimous decision loss to Glover Teixeira. Having been one of the highest earners in the UFC, most feared that Rampage had priced himself into an early retirement. So it came as a shock when the former champion signed a multi-fight deal with the ambitious Bellator promotion in 2013. Holding its first event in 2008, Bellator had quietly worked its way to being the sport's second biggest promotion, thanks to its combination of homegrown talent and established UFC veterans. Rampage's contract was part of an agreement between the promotion and parent company Spike TV, a similar setup that coaxed Tito Ortiz and King Mola Wall to the promotion a year earlier, with company president Bjorn Rebney citing Rampage's signing as key in breaking the pay-per-view market. Rampage too was optimistic about the arrangement, stating his intention to become the first man in company history to win titles at both heavyweight and light heavyweight. Rampage was all set to make his company debut against fellow big name signing Tito Ortiz, intended to be the headliner for the company's first foray on pay-per-view. Rampage and Ortiz spent several months promoting the fight, even appearing in a pro wrestling storyline, before Ortiz withdrew the week before the fight, citing a neck injury sustained in training. Bellator were forced to scale the event to a TV card, while Rampage made his debut as part of an eight-man light heavyweight tournament against Joey Beltran. Beltran was understandably cautious of the former champion, splitting his time between staying on the outside and clinching up against the fence. So when Rampage finally got the space to throw, he made the most of it. Counter knee from Joey Beltran. Oh, oh, hand. And that is it. Perhaps one second before the end of round one. Rampage scored another first round knockout in his semifinal win over Christian Mpumbu setting up a high-profile clash with King Molawal in the main event of Bellator 120. The card would be the second time Bellator tried to build a pay-per-view for Rampage, but it's one that nearly fell through, as Rampage was given a $10,000 fine due to an altercation with Mo during the pre-fight weigh-in, with the head of the Mississippi Athletic Commission claiming he nearly pulled Rampage from the card after insulting him following the reprimand. The fight itself would prove far from smooth sailing for Rampage, as Mo dominated the first round with his wrestling before a combination of jabs and uppercuts saw Rampage find his feet in the second. The match came down to a cagey final round, where Rampage did just enough in the eyes of the judges to claim a unanimous decision. Having passed the first true test of his tenure, Rampage was linked to several high-profile matches, with Tito Ortiz, light heavyweight champion Emmanuel Newton, and his long-awaited heavyweight debut all speculated in the weeks after the Mo fight. Rampage had the Bellator world at his feet, but it turned out his next move wouldn't be for the promotion at all. In December 2014, Rampage announced he signed a deal to return to the UFC, claiming Bellator had breached his contract after they refused to provide pay-per-view numbers for his match with Mo. Bellator, however, remained insistent Rampage was still under contract, 
and were granted an injunction forbidding Rampage from competing for their rival promotion. Eventually, an agreement between the two parties was reached, with Rampage being allowed to compete in a one-off match against Fabio Maldonado at UFC 186. While Rampage would win the fight by unanimous decision, its biggest impact came in the courtroom. As part of their legal battle, Bellator were forced to disclose the details of Rampage's contract, where it became clear just how much the company paid to acquire the former champion services. According to reports, Rampage's contract guaranteed him half a million dollars for pay-per-view events and $300,000 for TV cards, as well as a percentage of gate receipts. Other caveats included a reality TV show, a $100,000 sports car, and collaboration with a screenwriter to produce a Hollywood film. Although Rampage would re-sign with the promotion, the dirty laundry sealed the fate of Bjorn Rebney, with former Strikeforce boss Scott Coker taking his place as company president. Rampage's return to competition came at Bellator 157 against Olympic gold medalist Satoishi Ishii. Despite being a sizable underdog, Ishii used his renowned judo game to win the opening round, before Rampage utilized knees and uppercuts in the clinch to eke out a split decision. Despite the performance, many accuse Rampage of being out of shape and disinterested in the fight, an accusation that followed him into a rematch with King Mo at Bellator 175. I heard you're training with Kobayashi, the competitive eater, you know what I'm saying, for this. Who? Kobayashi, the hot dog eater. <laughs> That's he was training with. What the fuck is he talking about? He's Smash really hurting it. my feelings right now. Rampage came closest to finishing the fight by rocking Mo in the middle of the second. But a combination of takedowns and a strong ending in the final round saw Mo extract revenge for four years ago, handing Rampage his first loss of his Bellator tenure. After a second labored performance and admission his size was becoming a burden, Rampage's move to heavyweight was all but confirmed. In 2018, Rampage was chosen to compete in an eight-man tournament for the Bellator heavyweight title, after longtime champion Vitaly Minakov was stripped of the title for inactivity. Fans had hoped the new weight class would allow Rampage to recapture his old magic, but his plans were quickly undone against former UFC middleweight Chael Sonnen the bad guy winning a unanimous decision and eliminating Rampage from the competition. Desperate to revive interest in their star, Bellator turned to their trump card of long overdue rematches and booked Rampage in a bout against old rival Vanderlei Silva at Bellator 206. The two men had fought three times previously, with Vanderlei winning the first two fights in pride before Rampage got his revenge at UFC 92 but many were quick to criticize Bellator for exploiting two fighters past their prime for TV ratings. Coker taking a lesson from De La Hoya. Despite low expectations, the fight proved surprisingly competitive, with both men showing flashes of their old selves, before Rampage finished his fading opponent with strikes in the second round, and doing so leveling their series at two wins apiece. Jackson, oh. Oh. The fight proved to Bellator bosses Rampage still had some mileage as an attraction fighter. And when the company announced their first event in Japan, Rampage became a prime candidate to headline the card. Rampage's opponent that night would be MMA legend Fedor Emelianenko, intended as the first leg of a three-fight run before the Russian announced his retirement, with Rampage happy to play the comedy foil to his illustrious opponent. And it kind of ruined, actually, since I learned that, it kind of ruined my sex life, because when I'm having sex now, all I do, do is think about Fedor. <laughs> <laughs> I think about, damn, is Fedor having sex right now? Thinking about me? <laughs> Am I still hetero? I'm having sex with a girl, but thinking about Fedor having sex with a girl. While most of the early build centered around Fedor, the focus quickly shifted to Rampage, as the former light heavyweight champion hit the scales barely under the 265 pound weight limit. A terribly out of shape Rampage was overwhelmed almost immediately, as Fedor brought a merciful end to the fight in the middle of the first round. Big shot. Rampage's physique, along with his jovial post-fight behavior, added further ammunition to those who felt Rampage no longer cared about the sport. And in November 2020, company president Scott Coker announced the promotion would not renew Rampage's contract. 
Rampage would resurface 12 months later when he led Team MMA against boxing legend Shannon Briggs as a part of the upstart triad combat promotion, with Rampage endearing himself to his new bosses by suggesting the new promotion could soon rival the UFC. While most of the fighters covered in the series are undone by mileage, Rampage's downfall is almost self-inflicted. Although past his prime, Rampage showed in his first three matches he was capable of hanging with Bellator's top level but his considerable wage added with the fallout from the contract dispute massively affected his motivation. Rampage's Bellator run was such that the company chose to shift from signing washed veterans solely on the back of star power. Not the legacy I'd want to leave, but hey, it's a legacy nonetheless. This is the INC. Please like, share, subscribe, and ring the bell so you never miss a video. Hur, hur, hur.